Um, hi, so I'm Dr. Lubin, Aviva Lubin. I'm the Associate Stroke Director at Lenox Hill Hospital. And uh, I've been here quite a while, and <laughs> at least that's the way it seems. So I'm just giving a basic talk on stroke, uh, which is also called vascular neurology, and I'll explain in a minute about why. And um, so with stroke, stroke is, is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, though it might have really uh, progressed to the third. Um, but uh, no, I think it, it's, it was a third, now it's the fourth. Uh, it's one of the leading causes of serious long-term disability in the United States. There's about 800,000 strokes per year. About 600 are new strokes and about all close to 200 are recurrent. People that had strokes that have another one. So that's pretty, pretty often that people are having them. And uh, you know, a lot, there's a lot of morbidity that's involved with them. They have a lot of rehab needs. Uh, so a lot about 30% of the first stroke die within the first year, but we're working very hard on that. So there's about four to five million stroke survivors in the United States at this time. And they add up because they have a lot of rehab needs, they end up costing about $70 million per year. So that's a big drain on the American uh, Health Society. So uh, what is stroke? So uh, there's a TIA and a stroke. They're slightly different. Both of them have to do, if you see a stroke on the bottom, is a sudden focal neurological deficit due to cerebral ischemia, infarction, or hemorrhage, which persists for more than 24 hours. So the old definition of a TIA, TIA stands for transient ischemic attack, meaning something happened and the person had weakness and it went away. And that the old definition was that it was less than 24 hours. Now, now we're basically it's just if they had something and it went away, and there's no uh, no signs of the stroke on any of their workup. So then it could be with the right story. So TIA is all totally based on the story and uh, of what the person had. So um, what stands for stroke? Sorry, wrong order. So um, the regular things that cause stroke are hemiparesis. That means one side of the body is weak, right side, left side, hemisensory, one side or the other has decreased sensation. Aphasia means trouble with getting words out. So expressive aphasia is when they have word finding difficulty. It's very frustrating to the patient because they can't, they know what they want to say, but they can't get the words out. Receptive aphasia is the person is talking, but what they're saying makes no sense. Um, loss of vision and, or um, either one eye, fully one eye, or the right side or left side of both eyes. Uh, diplopia means double vision. That usually means is that the muscles that are moving your eyes aren't working in tandem. So the right eye might move further out than the left eye. And so the person is getting two uh, visions of what's going on. Uh, vertigo, which is basically dizziness, room spinning, ataxia is in balance. Uh, and, Sometimes, depending on what type of stroke it is, then it, it could present with a very, very severe headache. Um, what are stroke risk factors? So ones that we can't really do very much about is age, as a person ages, the blood vessels get more brittle, and they're higher risk of having a uh, breakdown, sex. Um, uh, males have a higher risk at a younger age, and then it, uh, it gets better. Race, race depends. Uh, African Americans have more of high blood pressure and then they have a higher risk of having a stroke. Uh, if someone has a history of a stroke, they're more prone towards having a stroke uh, unless we really take care of their risk factors. Family history. If a person has a history of a stroke or a heart attack at a young age, usually we call that less than 75 then they're at a high, they may be at higher risk for having a stroke because there may be a genetic disposition in the family for the person to have clotting. And so with anyone who comes in who's less than 75 and doesn't have a lot of the adjustable stroke risk factors, we're testing them to see if they have um, a genetic reason why, and that might change the medications that we use. So the adjustable risk factors, atrial fibrillation, 
So atrial fibrillation is an irregular, irregular heart rhythm. So instead of the heart beating boom, 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 the heart is beating out of sync. And what happens is, is that the chamber in the heart has is not fully contracting the whole time. And there is possibility of a clot forming there. And then that clot can then go and go to the brain. So the issue with uh, the way I describe it is if you were doing white water rafting and on the side there's this extra piece which is like sort of some dirty silt in it and as more dirt comes it links into this thing of dirt and it builds up and builds up and then that piece of dirt sometimes the white the water comes and could just bring that that piece of dirt into the main part of the water. And so hopefully the flow of the water is strong enough that, and there's enough room that the clock could just go and through the system without problem. But in general, the blood goes from the arteries to the small capillaries to the veins. Usually that piece of clock gets stuck in an artery or a capillary and it can't, it, it causes stroke. Um, hypertension or high blood pressure. So years of having blood pressure being high breaks down the blood vessels, makes them much more brittle. Elevated blood cholesterol. So uh, plaques fall, form on the walls of the blood vessels and cause narrowing. And there is a cholesterol cap on these plaques, but if let's say a well, plaque breaks down, then the body is made, is, has a mechanism which it says, we know something's attacking us. There's a, there's a something that's entering the blood system. So they end up coming and trying to block out this plaque. But by doing that, sometimes it ends up being uh, causing there to be a, a clot. And uh, at that point, diabetes. Diabetes is known to be a horrible disease affecting blood vessels. Uh, we know from uh, data in the heart that someone could have totally clean blood vessels around the heart and six months later have a huge heart attack. In the brain, the diabetes can cause narrowing and brittle blood, blood, blood vessels and send a person up for having a stroke. Heart disease, in general, uh, is a risk factor for having a stroke. It, both the heart and both heart attack and stroke are both the same principle. You have a blood vessels that get blocked. And so if someone has heart disease, they probably also have bad vessels in the brain. And smoking is also causes uh, narrow blood vessels. Um, some of the other risk factors, which are much lower, cocaine can cause uh, acute narrowing of the blood vessels, um, you know, certain medications as well. But these are the main risk factors. Um, so one of the ways that we know that we have in, uh, a lot of uh, in the community getting out to telling them uh, what to do for stroke is be fast. This is one of the most important things to take home when you're uh, dealing with any patients, if you have a relative, someone in, comes into the hospital, someone comes in school, they have be fast, uh, be, be balanced. If someone has it seems like they're walking like they're drunkard, but they're not, no alcohol on board, no reason that they're totally uh, lost of balance. Uh, e, eyes, if they have lost the vision in the right side, the left side, uh, full vision in one eye, those, that could be a stroke. If the face looks uneven, usually you ask people to show the teeth, and if the face is drooping, then that's a problem. Uh, arm or leg weakness, so it's weakness, the arm, right arm and leg weakness, left arm and leg weakness. It could just be a hand that's weak or an arm that's weak, but more, more usually it's an arm and a leg, and it's weakness in the whole arm, 
It's not like when sometimes you put your arm on a desk and then it feels numb. It's when the whole when the whole arm round the whole area feels weak or numb, generally that stroke. Uh, speech, when it's slurred, when it's trouble getting words out, that's speech. And T is just for time in terms of remembering that uh, I'll show you later some of the treatments that we have are only good for a very short period of time. And uh, that the FDA approved the faster we need to go, uh, the more important. So uh, what, is, what are we dealing with when we're dealing with stroke? We're dealing with the brain. The brain is complicated. It's been split up into multiple lobes, as you can see here on the side. The frontal lobe here is in the front, deals with uh, executive function. The occipital lobe is in the back. It deals with vision. Parietal lobe, generally right here, deals with sensory. Temporal lobe, right here, deals with, partly with speech partly with memory, the insula, that's pretty deep in, um, has some of the speech functions, the limbic lobe is emotions. So uh, each part of the brain has its own function, as you can see if it's schematics. So each part of the brain in the back of the brain is the balance, here's the vision, occipital lobe, speech is two sections, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, both deal with speech, uh, here's sensation, uh, there's emotion, hearing. So um, each part of the brain goes, deals with a different part. And based on where the stroke is, where the blockage is in the brain, you end up with an area that is affected. So if the frontal lobe is, is affected, so there's this story of a worker who got a metal piece through the front of his brain. And after that, his whole personality changed and he was cursing and he was just not himself. So that was because his frontal lobe in the front was affected. And so therefore a lot of the involuntary, um, the voluntary blocks were taken away and is it became involuntary. Over here is the speech functions here and here where uh, here's more of expressive aphasia, here's more of receptive aphasia. Between the two of them, if someone takes the whole area out, it can't get any words out at all. On uh, the frontal lobe, the uh, olfactory nerves, which are, are the nerve fibers for smell, are here, so they could get affected. The parietal lobe deals with sensation. Temporal lobe deals with healing and speech. Occipital lobe deals with vision. So, and the cerebellum back here, which is right in the back of the brain, deals with coordination. So, you, you have is that every part of the of the brain uh, is affect, it has a purpose, and even a small little dot can affect and cause problems for a person if part of the brain is out. So, uh, how is the brain even within each of these areas uh, um, in, uh, arranged? So see over here, this is one of the main motor uh, cortexes. So it means that all the strength that a person has is along this area. Along that area, the whole body is set up. So, but there's many more things that our face do, do than the rest of the body or our hands. So a lot more of the brain is taken care of with our face and our hands than the rest of the body. And it's all arranged very carefully along what's called the homunculus. And the same thing with the sensory, all together along the way. So each thing in, in the sensory, you have the tongue takes up more uh, space than even the hands. And so you, when you see comparing these two, there's more motor involved in the hand than there is in the sensory. So there's less spirit brain involved with, uh, with the hands but every single space has it. So it's not only which lobe it's involved, but also where in the lobe you have an issue. So there's two types of strokes. One type is called ischemic stroke. That's when the area has a clot and a clot forms at the area of the blood. As I was saying, let's say there's a plaque on the side of the wall that bursts, or there's a clot that comes from the heart and stops there. Then that area of the brain doesn't have blood and there could be blockage. On the other hand, you have what's called a hemorrhagic stroke. That's a bleeding stroke. That's bleeding in the brain. Instead of there being blockage, the blood vessel itself ruptures 
and of course there's bleeding in the brain. And so the blood itself is toxic to the brain and can cause problems. So what causes uh, the ischemia and what causes hemorrhage? So ischemic and the blockage. Here up here is the brain blood vessels. Here's the heart. The aorta comes out of the heart, goes to the rest of the body. But here it goes up to the brain through what's called the carotid arteries. And so you can either have a clot form in the heart itself, sometimes because of the atrial fibrillation, sometimes because of the heart disease weakening the heart and a clot forms in the heart itself. And then you go, it could travel up. Sometimes you could have a clot form in the carotid artery itself. And then it goes from the carotid artery and goes up. And sometimes you have it in the artery itself the arteries in the brain from the years of the high blood pressure, the cholesterol, the diabetes, the smoking could cause narrowing at the blood vessel. So it all depends where the clot is and how what happens. It's like a tree. If you get something down at the bottom of the area, you're going to have a much bigger stroke than if you get just one of the branches higher up. And that makes a difference in terms of what the person's disabilities are and what they're going to have. So here's just the vision of the brain from the bottom of the brain. Uh, this is if you take the brain off and you look at the bottom, here's the, here's the uh, cerebellum, maxillary lobe, here's the frontal lobes, okay? And here's the blood vessels. There's two blood supplies to the brain. One is the carotids in the front. If you feel on the side of your neck and only ever feel one side, you can feel the blood uh, pounding. That's the carotid. Okay, that fills that fills like about two thirds of each side. In the back, there's something called the vertebral arteries, and that's right here in the back. Here, it comes up the back of your neck, and it joins up into the basal, and it goes and feeds the back of the neck. The front, the 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 carotids come up into the brain, and then they split up. So every part of the brain gets blood supply. But if you see, if something happens here in the back, it's going to be much worse than if it takes just one of the other small blood vessels. If something blocks the main blood vessel going into the brain, it's going to be much worse than if it takes off one of the smaller blood vessels. So how, how do they track in the brain? So you can see as the blood vessels come up, one blood vessel, uh, the, the main uh, carotid splits into two blood vessels. The middle cerebral artery that feeds two thirds of the brain, and the anterior cerebral, which feeds the main part down the middle. Now, how does that translate? I'll show you a uh, graph later. But if you remember the homunculus, which takes the brain and the mortifiers all the way around, the leg is here towards the middle of the brain. So if you have a stroke in the anterior cerebral artery, you end up with more leg weakness than arm weakness. If you end up taking a stroke out here, you have more problems in your arms than you have in your legs. So sometimes you see people who can't move their arm at all, but their leg, they can walk with some stiffness in their leg. Usually that means it was a middle cerebral artery stroke where the arm was affected more and wasn't returning back to normal. Here in the occipital lobe, this is more where the vision centers are and uh, the deep, deep fibers depend on where the blood supply comes from. Some of it is from the back and some of it is from the front. Okay, so the carotid circulation, just to go through some of the examples. So if the first artery of the carotid is the ophthalmic artery. So it comes up when, you cut, when the blood comes into the brain, it can make this 90 degree tall, uh, turn and goes right into the eye. And the person says, they lose their vision. They can't see anything. Sometimes they can see like a little moon on the bottom or the outside, but the whole vision is out. Sometimes it takes out only a branch of it, and then they can have either, they can't see the top or the bottom. And when you run your finger down straight from top to bottom, there's a specific point where suddenly they can't see anything above or below that level. The anterior cerebral artery, just as I said, it causes weakness leg more than arm. Because it also affects a lot of the frontal lobes, it causes a lot of these emo uh, executive function problems, problems with emotion 
and uh, just not one having not having emotion on what you really want to do. The middle cerebral is our essential, most essential part. And I have another screen to just compare the two, but uh, left and right is different. So that's why neurologists always ask if a person is right-handed or left-handed. If a person is right-handed, then the speech center is in the left side of the brain. If a person is left-handed, 75% of them, the speech is in the right, is still in the left side of the brain. But the other 25, it's more split between the brains. So if you have a, a stroke on the left side of the brain, the left middle cerebral, you have aphasia, which is called speaking. Together with the right side being weak, having the right side having sensory problems, numbness, having vision problems, not being able to see the right side of both eyes. So people think that they lost vision in the right eye, but that's not correct. They just, if they either eye, they can't see the right side. So, and if it's the right side, the right side is not the speech center section. So uh, the, that the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. They end up with left side of weakness, left side of numbness, left side of vision problems. And they also have this special thing called neglect. What is neglect? The worst kind of neglect is you show someone their arm and they tell you it's your arm. So I've had patients that had a large right MCA stroke, right middle cerebral artery stroke, and the guy wanted to just get out of bed because he says, I don't know why you have me here, I feel fine. But he couldn't move the whole left side of his body. He just was so neglectful of the left side that he had no idea that the left side of his body was weak. Okay, so again, right? When the right brain is going, we have this neglect, left-sided symptoms. If you have the left side is weak, then you have speech, major speech problems, and the right side of the body is weak. Um, so these are just a few examples. I'll try to lead you through them, just to, to give an example. This person had a big stroke. If you look here, here's the carotids coming up on both sides. And when you come, this is where they should look. I come out and they feed like a tree, feed with a lot of branches. But if you go on the other side, suddenly the blood vessel just stops and there's no blood going into that side of the brain. And that's what you can see here. This is the normal brain. There's an inside that dark brain and an outer ribbon that's white. But here, this person, if you draw a tri if you draw a triangle right here, you can see that this person's brain here on the right side is weak. And this person had new onset of atrial fibrillation of this irregular heart rhythm, and she was in the hospital, and she ended up with, she had already created a clot in her heart because of the atrial fibrillation. It ended up lodging right here in the middle of the brain, and she ended up with a big stroke. This is a different example. This is a 42-year-old female. She was getting dressed in the morning, and when she was putting on her heels, she just felt like she did. She felt like her right side was weak, and she came into the hospital. And you can see here when the blood vessel is coming up, they, it, there's just a cutoff. This is the other side is the right way comes out goes to blood vessels. Here on the right, there's just a big cutoff. So where did that come from? How did he, she have a big clot in her brain? So this side explains it. The carotid was coming up and it was coming up and then suddenly it just stops. And what that called is called a dissection. So what's a dissection? A dissection is a tearing of the blood vessels. So it's not that there's a clot from the inside that closes off the blood vessel. The outside wall of the blood vessel is made of three layers each side. And there's a tear in those three sides. So blood fills between either first and second layer or the second and third layer, and then gets pushed down into this flame situation right here and closes down the blood vessel. And it's like when you tear a piece of fabric, the pieces can sometimes take off and then go flying. And that's what happened here. Her blood vessel ended up getting blocked. We were able in this patient to give her TPA, which I will discuss later, which is a clot buster medication. And I have data showing that this blood vessel here in the brain opened up. And so therefore, instead of the whole brain getting blocked like the previous lady, all she had was this small stroke here. So the other lady had 
uh, would it, if she was at risk of losing the whole left side of her brain, having major speech problems, major weakness on the right side, and instead she had this area on the right that uh, on the left. This is the left brain, and she had very minimal weakness. And like three years later, after having Rhea, her main complaint was that she can't wear flip flops because she can't curl her toes into the flip flop. But overall, she was she's been doing great and. Uh, the blood vessels healed on its own, and she's doing amazing. Okay, now in terms of the blood vessels from the back of the brain, that was things that could happen in the carotids in the front. When the verte when a vertebral artery in the back has a problem, then it affects the back of the brain, which is called the posterior cerebral artery. And there it involves the vision centers. And um, but then in the when the, the vertebral arteries come together to the basilar which that is the main uh, blood supply to the brain stem, which connects the brain to the spinal cord. And because it's like the tree trunk, everything is running through there. So you could have weakness, you could have numbness, you could have speech problems, you could have, you have slurred speech, you could have uh, vision problems. You could, there's almost everything that you could have, you could have because all the blood vessels are running through there. And then attached to the back of the brain is the cerebellum, and the cerebellum deals with balance. So you can have vertigo, you can have nausea, vomiting, just total imbalance of what you're doing. So uh, this patient right here, they had a clot. So if you look at the blood vessel, really the clot is right here, and it's like a wedge shape going back. This is the occipital lobe. So this is their right occipital lobe. This person had left visual problems, okay? This one is hard to see, so I circled it. This is the brain stem. It sits between up here is the brain, and the back is the cerebellum, and here is the brain stem, which connects the brain to the spinal cord. There's this little white area right here, which that part of the uh, brain stem is affected, and it caused the person to have the balance, it caused them to have uh, problems with sensation on the other side of the body, it, you know, ma major differences. Okay. Here's just a, uh, like an example, which is interesting. Here's the vertebral arteries coming together. They go into that basilar, that main blood vessels that I saw, and then they go into the posterior cerebral arteries. What you see here is a major, major narrow. There's a cutout here, which is a plaque that is sitting on the wall of the blood vessel. And that creates a difference in the blood flow here, which caused there to be clot that came up into the brain that affected both sides because since it's one blood vessel that splits both sides, this person had loss of vision on both sides. And so with the stroke became blind and couldn't see anything. So it's not that the eyes are having a problem. The eyes are fine. When the person has a stroke, their muscles in their arms are fine. It's the signal from the brain going to the body that is not working because the brain is not working, okay? What can we do to treat uh, the strokes? So the only FDA approved treatment for a stroke is called TPA. It's the, we, we call it the drop um, clot buster medication. And uh, it's been shown to, uh, to, to break up the clots uh, better, better than placebo, it was approved in 1995. And now that is what the, now all the hospitals have what's called stroke codes, which when the patient comes in the door, they were, were looking to see if we could use this medication. So why do, why do is that important? Because the longer the brain doesn't have blood supply, the larger the stroke. So just because here you might have a small area that's involved, but all this other area is at risk of clotting, and the longer that it's clotting, the more of the brain is going to die. But if we could get blood to that area, we have the potential for to save all that area that's at risk and just have a small stroke, not a big stroke. And a person has a much better chance of recovering from a small stroke than a big stroke. So what was the data from the 1995 study? So overall, many more people did better on the TPA than placebo. So usually we quote that 35% more people did well with the TPA than did otherwise. Not only that, but there was no difference in mortality 
is actually, you know, slightly better, but really get a, 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 no difference in mortality. And but mo many more people were able to go home and have less disability with doing it. So we try to give people TPA. Problem is, there's an exponential curve here. So the TPA works better at the beginning. We always say time is brain. And so the sooner we could give it to them, the better. So we've given TPA here in let's say 13 minutes after the patient walked into the hospital because we try to do it as fast as we can. All we really need to give TPA is a good story, a CAT scan of the head, which doesn't show any bleeding. Because remember, there's two kinds of strokes. There's ones with clots and one with bleeds. You don't want to give someone who's bleeding a clot buster medication, but someone, but they look the same. Both of them could come in with speech problems or vision problems or, or, or weakness or numbness. And we don't, the only way we know is we do a CAT scan of the head, if there's no clot, then we can give them TPA. So based on the chart, the original study said it was good till three hours because about that point, the benefit for TPA versus the bleeding risk of the TPA was about mixed, matched up. So until about 2010, you're only able to give TPA for people up to three hours after symptoms started, not when they showed up to the hospital, but when symptoms started. So if they were talking to someone and they stopped talking or they were at eating out at a restaurant and then they got weak in the right side, we know exactly when it started and then we can treat. And that was up to three hours. In 2010, there was a study that looked at all the way up to in three, four and a half hours. And so we were able to extend the, the window from the three hours to four and a half. So now we can treat people with TPA up to four and a half hours from when the symptoms started. Okay, and what else can we do for these patients? Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a very small window that we have, and a lot of people, they wake up with strokes. You know, a lot of people, they go to sleep, they feel fine, they're about 10 o'clock, they wake up in the morning at eight o'clock and they're weak on the right side, or they feel like they're a little bit off. Or, you know, the, the more typical story is, I woke up at, ten, at eight, I was feeling fine. At 10 o'clock, I felt weak, but I thought it was gonna pass. So I just uh, stayed in bed, then I called my primary doctor. I went to go see him. He sent me to the emergency room. So, but the next thing you know, it's 10 hours later after the stroke. So, um, you know, you don't even know. You know the real last normal, according to the uh, NIND, uh, N NINDS trial of 1995, was that the last normal would be counted as the 10 o'clock when they went to bed. So what do we do for these new patients? So uh, just a few years ago, we ended up with some groundbreaking uh, trials. So uh, in the early 2000s, they started with the uh, doing interventional procedures. So what does that mean? They would go up into the clot and they would try to get a, the first, the first piece was called a mercy retriever. They would go in and it would be a piece that looked like a screw and it would go into the clot and then they would pull it out. And uh, that was done up to eight hours post-stroke. And it worked, but they, it also hurt, they injured the blood vessel wall. So they were looking for other methods to see what else they could do. So uh, one of the things that they came up with was this, what's called penumbra, which is like a vacuum. It comes up with a piece, they put it up, and here's the vacuum piece that goes into the clot, and it basically sucks the clot in. And so they just put the, deploy the device and wait about five minutes, and then they see what happens, and then they pull out as much as they can of the clot. And so, you know, it, it was shown to work. And the second one is uh, what's called a stent retrievers. So these really make a big difference. They go up and at the end of the catheter, when they get to the clot, they put this retriever in, this stent in, but it's a retrievable stent. It's not like in the heart where they put in a stent and they come in. They put in the stent and the clot gets caught in the stent and then they pull the stent out together with the clot on it. So you end up with a, a way of going into the brain and getting it out. So 
Here, let's say here, your blood vessel comes up, the carotid comes up. Instead of just moving through, there's a clot sitting right here. These devices would come in and go pull the clot out. Okay, well, which patients do you know? How do you know which patients you should use for this and which patients you shouldn't? So uh, you, you don't want to cause bleeding. You don't want to cause that you're going to open a clot and then cause the brain to bleed. Which areas are more prone to clot? So the larger the area of, of stroke that's already there, the larger area of brain that's already broken down, the higher the risk of bleeding. I use an example. If you have a plant at home and you water it, if the soil is moist, you could give it more water and the soil will take it. But if the soil is hard, like a rock, like you're in a desert and you put in water, it's just going to travel. It's just going to go. You're just going to end up with bleeding. It's not going to go into the brain. It's not going to be absorbed and help it. The brain is already dead in that area. So it's not going to help. So you want to end up with getting the right patients for the right situations. So they did a lot of studies. In 2013, all the studies were negative, but that was before the prenup, before stent retrievers. These are all studies doing stent retrievers or penumbra, and they're all within six to 12 hours of what the studies were. And they all showed that if you have a large vessel block, like the main blood vessels of the, uh, the carotid, main blood vessels of the middle cerebral, and you open it, that there was benefit. You also had, there was a study called the Dawn and the Fuse, and they, I'll show you an example based on it. They used more imaging in the brain to try to see where you had this difference between what was brain that was lost and here I am, this image, which is the brain that's already in the clot and which is what we call the penumbra, which is the extra, what's saved. And these studies, based on the, the imaging, they opened it as far as 24 hours. So now someone can wake up in the morning and say, I went to bed at 10 p.m., and we can still go in if the imaging is, is looks good, and we can go and get the blood vessel. So well, this is just a case. 75-year-old female patient was on atrial fibrillation, where she had known atrial fibrillation with irregular, irregular heart rhythm. She wasn't on any blood thinners to help with keeping the blood flowing, which has been proven to help with stroke. Uh, prevent prevent clotting uh, because she did have some uh, recent uh, um, uh, falls. She had high blood pressure, uh, small bowel, a history of small bowel obstruction, right hip fracture. She came in at 11.30 in the morning, had aphasia, problem speaking, and right-sided weakness while she was at yoga. So um, she came in, uh, they, the uh, emergency room I mean, the EMS picked them up, brought her to us, and um, uh, then when, when, she, when we examined her, she wasn't speaking at all, she couldn't move the right side of the body at all, and her blood vessels were normal. We did a CAT scan of her head. It showed um, a small area in the left front that already showed a stroke. I'll show you her images in a moment, in, in a moment. but it also showed what we call is a, a left it's a dense MCA. That means that you're already looking like maybe there's a clot in this middle cerebral artery. So we do what's called a CTA of the head and neck. So this is a CAT scan where they give dye and it lights up just the blood vessels in the brain, in the neck and the brain. And what it showed was that the, the neck was fine, normal blood vessels in the neck, but in the brain itself, there was a blockage in the left middle cerebral uh, artery, just like I showed you some of the examples from before. And so her whole left brain was now at risk. And that's why she wasn't speaking, she wasn't on the right side of her body. What they did was called a CT perfusion. Now this is a study that was in the Dawn and Fuse study. And that left, that matches up the, what's called the, the um, core stroke with what's per number. So, it, if you look at the bottom of the screen, this is what a perfusion study looks like. The cerebral blood flow, the blood flow 
is right now just slow in this one area. This is the area of the stroke. But the part that's at risk is the full MCA territory. And as we had shown before, here's the brain, here's the cat scan of the brain, shows almost no stroke, and there's there's really the area where the, the clot is. And here, same thing, blood vessels comes up and there's no blood flow here. And if it can't go through, this these blood vessels are here right this minute because what the lady has is collaterals because in her 75 years, her blood vessels, the brain, as far as the other parts of the brain are giving her blood, but these are gonna fail if we don't go and open up this clot. So based on this difference between the two, which is this mismatch ratio. So if the mismatch ratio is greater than 1.8, then what I do is I call my contacts in the interventional department and they come and they go through and use either the penumbra or stem retrievers, and they go and pull out the clot and they take the clot away from here and give good blood flow. So, um, so oh, I've got this, she had gotten TPA 14 minutes after arrival at the hospital because we knew she was coming because EMS called ahead and said she's coming. We met her, did all these blood, these images in the CAT scan machine. We were able to Ready, able to give her the TPA. Then we were able, at the end of the TPA, she was able to move the right side a little bit, tell me her name and name a few objects, but she couldn't, the, the uh, speech wasn't fluid and she still had trouble getting words out. So she, um, we called the interventional, they came in and they did the thrombectomy. They were able to open it up pretty quickly and she then went to the ICU. And I went to see her later that day, and amazing. She was fully awake. She was talking, moving everything, no weakness, no numbness, no balance, no problems at all. And when she left the hospital, I think it was two days later, she was doing amazing and uh, a little bit fatigued, which is normal post-stroke, but overall she was doing amazing. So uh, she... Uh, this is this is the best of the best. I can't say we do this all the time, but this is the goal, and this is why we train and why we do stroke code in order to get these patients as well as they can. And so, uh, you know, in terms of stroke, it's it could it could cause a lot of disability, but in what makes my day flow really well and happy is when I can have one of these patients and do well. Uh, if they do end up with the stroke, we do put them in our stroke unit and we take care of them. We take care of their blood pressure, and take care of the cholesterol, and take care of diabetes, and take care of the heart disease, and we encourage them to stop smoking. And we, we deal with, if they don't, we don't know that they have atrial fibrillation, we put on holter monitors uh, to try to diagnose if they have it, especially as people age, the risk of uh, getting atrial fibrillation goes up. So we have detected people even after uh, several months later having atrial fibrillation, and then that affects the medications that we get we provide to the patients, whether they're aspirin, whether they're cholesterol medication, um, in addition to treating all the risk factors. And so it all comes together in terms of trying to prevent the next stroke. So the number one uh, question I get from patients when they come to the office is, well, we're worried that we're gonna have another stroke. So my answer is, if we treat what caused the stroke, plus we have you either an aspirin or enough strong blood thinners, and we have you on cholesterol medication, then you're doing the best you can to prevent another stroke. And there's a lot of data to show us that, um, that that's the best thing in terms of, of what's to prevent stroke. So uh, that's the information that I have. So if anyone has any questions, I'm open to answering questions um, and going from there. Can you see the um, chat? So, um, okay, so uh, I saw, I missed the first question, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, they're gonna come in very quickly, so just answer the ones that you can get to. So well, I saw one that said, could you do anything like if a blood vessel ruptures? So if there's a bleed, it's a very different set of um, rules. If it's a bleed, you can't give TPA. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, 
uh, then then you need to go, it depends on the size of the bleed, it depends. There's a right side and the left side of the brain, and um, they need to stay on their own side, because if one shifts to the other, so if there's a bleed on the left side of the brain and causes shift to the other side, then you end up with problems on the on the right side of the brain as well as the left side. So if there's shift, then the neurosurgeons will go up and open up the brain. But if the if it's just a small stroke, then we're probably going to just deal with keeping controlling the blood pressure. There's data to show that if you control the blood pressure, then you can um, then then you bring down the risk of the of the bleed growing. So the smaller the bleed, the less disability that they have. Um, then there are a lot of questions. Uh, so there was a question about the difference of treating the dissection than if it's just a blockage. No, it's basic. Well, it's ba it's sim basically similar because the study of the the treatments uh, doing uh, for the for the dissection between the aspirin and the strong uh, anticoagulants. Um, the, they, it didn't show that there was really much difference. So it depends on the patient. If the patient has already a lot of stroke on the scan, then I do use the stronger blood, blood thinners. Um, but, uh, but if I see that the, um, if they don't have a lot of uh, damage in the brain, then I might just start them an aspirin or aspirin plavix, which is another medications. Um, uh, then there was a question about how COVID affected stroke. So we don't, we found that uh, COVID was a big risk of clotting, and so a lot of people did uh, come in and were came in with fever, and then in the ICUs in the hospital ended up with clots and strokes, and we ended up having to treat them. So it was. Um, so that that was it, it was a lot of a lot of work, a lot of regular stroke patients did not come in because they were worried about getting COVID. And I think that a certain percentage of patients would have, might have died because they didn't come in or ended up with disability when they could have done better. Um, uh, in terms of the question, do you need all the all the treatment, the things from BFAST or only a few? You only need one of the BFAST to have a stroke. You could just have vision loss or just have weakness or just, it, it really depends. At, but even just one of them, you have the person should come in and get tested because any of them, as I said, th that part of the brain goes from there. So, um, so then, uh, what's called? Oh, so in terms of recovery, so what I found is is that if someone has weakness, it's easier to deal with physical therapy, occupational therapy. If they have speech problems, you deal with speech therapy. If they have numbness, it's very hard to get back numbness. It's very, there's nothing that really we could do to get the brain to re-feel that feeling. So sometimes it's less bothersome for the patients. Sometimes it goes the other way and they get what's called a pain syndrome where they get, um, uh, what's it called? Where they, where they get pain in the area and then we have to pay, treat what's called neuropathic pain, which is pain caused by neuropathy. Um, now, it, the strokes can happen different times, different people. So uh, some people have better collaterals. And so uh, the people with better collaterals, they're gonna have a longer period of time till their stroke symptoms show. But someone who, let's say a young person, who's just one to three has a dissection, they don't have good collaterals. They're gonna show their symptoms quicker an 85 year old who's had a blood vessel that's been sort of closing down for a while and then the last little bit closes down they can probably last longer and another issue is, is that the brain gets smaller over time so we call cerebral atrophy the brain gets a little smaller with time so uh, that's part of it being more brittle but on the other hand if the person say has a bleed or has a large stroke and if there's any swelling around it it's um so then it's, it's, it's possible to, for the person to not need more, more uh, treatments than say a young person who has a large stroke is going to have a lot of shift in the brain from the area of the stroke, from the swelling from the stroke, and the surgeons may have to go and open up that side of the brain to give the brain a little bit of room to 
grow and expand and come back. So, um, so I saw another question, which was, does tremor, uh, is that one of the symptoms? And the answer is in general, no. Tremor is not one of them, and it's really imbalanced, okay? Um, in terms of our best treatments for stroke, there's a lot of data from the 80s that aspirin is very worthwhile in terms of treatment, so I have to keep telling my patients that aspirin is a medication for you. It's not just when you have pain that you take it. You have to take it every day. There's other medications in the aspirin category of antiplatelet, Plavix, Preventa, that are also used that are stronger than the aspirin if a person fails the aspirin. If they have the atrial fibrillation, it's the only indication in stroke to use the strong, what we call anticoagulation, like warfarin, or the new medications, which are called Eliquis, Pradaxa, and Zoralto. And those are much stronger. They have a higher risk of bleeding, so that's why we don't start with any of those medications because the, the risk outweighs the benefit. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, that's a good question. So we just asked, how do you maximize patient adherence to medications? Uh, that's part of why I see them more often than less often. I try to see my patients every three to six months to really be on top of them, to remind them that they did have a stroke because a lot of times they recover and they feel like they feel fine. And so, um, you know, we, we need to uh, just run, they must, must take their meds, they must keep doing the exercise and go from that. And so um, it's really important that we go from there. In terms of treatments for stroke afterwards, after the, when the patient comes in, we get, we try to get them TPA or get, give them the, uh, do the thrombectomy as fast as we can, and then um, get them into recovery, which is in terms of looking for other areas of stroke, doing echocardiogram to look at their heart, look, doing, you know, seeing anything else that's, that's going to happen. Um, uh, let's see, what else was there? Um, the, the diff, there's, the difference of which thrombectomy device that they use is up to the interventionalist, and uh, it's not really that different between the two. I, th I think uh, they usually do whichever one is like they, they were having good success from uh, previously, and so uh, they go from there. Uh, and all the patients who get thrombectomies go into the ICU, and then they get treated, and after a day or so, they come to the stroke unit and go from there. Um, I can't honestly uh, remember any of the rest of the questions. Uh, always happy to answer any of your uh, questions. If you, uh, you could send me an email at alubin at northwell.edu or uh, happy to talk to you or anything like that. Uh, should stroke patients get regular follow-up scans? The answer is in general, no. I mean, in the hospital, we follow up. If they have a bleed, we follow up. So if they follow up, then if they have a bleed, about a month later, we're gonna follow up and try to make sure that the blood has gone away before trying to figure out why, like further why they had to bleed and what's going on. There were a few questions about pediatric stroke. So um, I'm an adult, uh, adult neurologist. Uh, pediatric strokes in general and juvenile strokes are caused by more of genetic reasons than other things. Um, babies having strokes, it's more reason um, with what's going on uh, in, with their genetics and what's happening than uh, with older people who have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, um, and going from there. So, and I see that email is correct. That is my email. So anyone can send me. I'll try to keep up with all of the, uh, the emails and the, the answers if I can. Um, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lula. Okay, I'm gonna leave, okay? Yep, sounds good. I'm gonna get the next speaker set up, but thank you so much for joining us today. It was great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure.